Okay, today we're going to have a little mini lecture on how to put the exercises you've learned so far in principles in RS1 and RS2 together with your findings from the fitness screen. So we've looked at the fitness screen in principles. We've looked each weekend that we've been together and this is just to help you look at it with those exercises in mind and start to think about how you're going to choose exercises as soon as you see on that fitness screen result that's provided in your book uh, as soon as you see what the limitations are you're already thinking about uh, the fine points of how it's graded and what movements you're going to be thinking about right from the very beginning so what I've done is written down um, just this is from your book basically what the, um, the test is testing for. So this is going to be something you could put on a, a worksheet if it helps you to, to look at the, really, the reasons that we're doing these tests. Um, and then just for your, your, to get the thoughts going and, and especially for the rehab folks that are using the Nagi grid, and we don't quite have the emphasis on the fitness screen for rehab as we do on the Nagi grid and your problem solving, your stages, and so on and so forth. But it's still very, very useful for you to know and be familiar with the fitness screen. And the fitness screen is a tool for you to use um, as a way to objectively quantify improvement over periods of time. It's used to decide where to put a new client into a class level if you have a beginning, intermediate, and advanced, which you most likely will wherever you're working. Or even just as a therapist, if you've got somebody that's, you know, if you've got one of the businesses like mine where it's, it's kind of a gray area between PT and Pilates, you know, who do I get as a Pilates client that doesn't have some therapy issues? Nobody. So it's useful to have this tool. I use both in my practice. So this is for everybody in the course, the S's and the R's. So first of all, let's start with our half squat and just kind of take a look at it. So the half squat test tests for disassociation of the hips from the pelvis and lumbar spine, and it tests to see if that client can maintain their spine in neutral. So I just highlighted disassociation and put in brackets here stabilization for spine in neutral. Now again, those are concepts that are more geared towards the rehab people than the um, studio folks. So I'm trying to frame this in a way that, that our rehab folks are going to be kind of looking at this, as well as the studio. It's helpful for you guys to know this too, because we talk about it in our discussions. So we've got some disassociation and stabilization that we're already looking at in the test. That should give you a big step forward into what you're thinking about as far as exercises that you're going to want to put into this program for somebody who is showing a lack of ability to disassociate or a lack of ability to stabilize the spine. Okay, so that's kind of how we're going to go through it. The full squat, lower extremity strength or leg strength and control in full knee flexion. Again, that's going to require disassociation and stabilization, but we're also looking at strength and control. We're throwing some other things in here. We're going to get to applying the principles as soon as we get going through all of this list, so don't worry. We're getting there. Um, the heel raise, basically calf muscle strength and balance. So a part of the balance piece is going to be some stability. There's going to be some stabilization involved. All right, so I've, I've highlighted stabilization in there. Something that you can be thinking about. They're going to need to have that ability to stabilize the relationship of the rib cage to the pelvis in order to raise up onto those balls of the feet unassisted without having to hold on to something. Um, goal post on the wall. Postural alignment is being tested here. What are the things that we often see? We often see that thoracic spine extension coming away from the wall if they can't get the arms back there. They're going to compensate with thoracic spine extension. Shoulder abduction and external rotation and again the spine control exactly what I was just talking about with the extension. So there's got to be some disassociation of the upper extremity from the trunk. Right? We don't Maybe we haven't talked about that a whole lot yet because we haven't had a whole lot of upper extremity repertoire at this point. But there is going to be that, that thinking about the ability to, to disassociate that arm movement so that when the arm is raised, it doesn't just go right into a thoracic extension to reach. Right? We want to be able to achieve that full range of motion before we add the extension. 
Um, so there's our, dis our, our disassociation at the shoulder joint and the stabilization of the trunk, uh, specifically of the thoracic spine as we look at this particular test. The long sit test, primarily hamstring flexibility and then that spine stability on top of that hamstring flexibility. So then again, there's that disassociation at the hip along with that ability to maintain the rib to pelvis connection as they're seated. Seated hip abduction next. Length of hip adductors, so the inner thighs. Capular, capsular restriction, so that's the capsular restriction that could potentially be there around each hip. Right? In the merm or in the seated hip abduction, we're going to see it again in the Z-sit mermaid. I'm just getting ahead of myself. Um, in, in this position, we could see uh, some capsular restriction causing maybe a, a position of the pelvis that's in too much of an anterior tilt, too much of a posterior tilt. That can be a reflection of capsular restriction or just simply the inability to get the legs apart. Core stability is that ability to keep the pelvis in a fairly vertical relationship to the ground. So again, there's got to be some disassociation at the hip and some stability of the relationship of rib cage to pelvis. Z-sitting is your mermaid position, which is also sometimes called figure four. It's getting into the internal and external rotation flexibility. You're also going to be looking potentially at some capsular issues there and range of motion into hip, internal and external rotation. Um, you're also going to be kind of looking for some of that core stability too. This is one of those positions where you're going to tend to see a lot of extension in the spine. So again, you've got your disassociation stabilization that's being tested here. So for the roll-up, spine flexor strength and articulation into flexion. So we're looking into our segmental articulation now, but we're looking at that spine flexor strength. So it doesn't really say we're looking at abdominal strength. We kind of are. Um, the, the, the abdominals being spine flexors. So you're thinking that as you're looking uh, at the quality of the movement. So since we're looking at that articulation, we're looking at mobilization. You can see that we've switched from that disassociation and stabilization into mobilization now. The hundred is deep abdominal control in spine flexion in a sustained position of upper spine flexion. So, you know, you've got the elements of stabilization, but you've also got some elements of mobilization just in a limited part of the spine. You can look at it in both ways. Not much in the way of disassociation here, though. Side lift trunk and shoulder girdle stability, and hip abductor, so away from the body, abductor strength. Okay, so we're looking at the ability to disassociate, and with that lift of the leg into hip abduction, where we're testing that hip abductor strength, we've got to have some stability of the trunk, as well as that, you know, there we go, we've got the trunk stability, the shoulder girdle stability, but the hip abduction has got to have your disassociation, the stabilization speaks to that trunk and shoulder stability. Now we're over to the last column here, push up. So we're looking at upper extremity strength now, we haven't really looked at that, um, and scapular stability, which we just took a look at in side lift. So here, we're looking at the stability of the trunk, but we're really not saying that that's a big part of what we're looking at in the verbiage that's associated with our look at the test, but really you are taking a look at that. So I put disassociation primarily, but stabilization as well. You're, you're watching for that sagging of the spine. You're watching for that maintenance of the rib cage to pelvis um, connection. So you've got the disassociation, and why did I put that primarily? Because we are looking at the strength and the scapular stability, the ability to disassociate again, here's that arm from the thoracic spine, much as we saw in goalpost on the wall. Superman, there's spine and hip strength and flexibility now into extension. So this is a little bit of the opposite of roll-up, because we were looking at into flexion, now we're into extension, but they're both going to be mobilization. 
You've got the hip strength element as well. There's not a great deal, though, of hip disassociation in here, which is why I have not included the disassociation in the vest. Prone shoulder flexion. Shoulder flexion strength and range of motion in the prone position. So here, <clears throat> we've got a bit of disassociation of the upper extremity from the thoracic spine as you press down and lift up so that it's not just all one movement. But you've got a little bit of some mobilization in there as well. It's a little more subtle and more limited. But we've got a bit of the disassociation of the upper extremity from the thoracic spine. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I went on to prone press up. Prone shoulder flexion. There's the disassociation of the upper extremity from the thoracic spine. Pardon me. So now we're on to prone press up. I've already given you all that. Distribution of spine extension between cervical, thoracic, and lumbar segments. So there is our mobilization, especially depending upon how high they come up. So your mobilization, prone press up, and disassociation of the upper extremities from the thoracic spine, prone shoulder flexion. So sorry if I caused any confusion there. Prone knee bend is really hip flexor flexibility. So that's on the stomach bending the knee to pull the heel towards the bottom. So we're, we're taking up all the slack in the iliopsoas and the rectus femoris. So we're going all the way through the entire hip flexor complex that's starting from the lumbar spine and continuing through the anterior aspect of your femur and down with its attachment just beyond the kneecap. So there really isn't um, a whole lot of, of disassociation mobilization that fits into this one, so I just kind of let it be as it is. Now, um, you've, everybody's got a good chance to look at this, write it down, use it as a format as you will. I'm going to erase the last two columns, and we're going to start to look at how the movement sequences that you've learned so far fit in to these classifications. So we're going to start with the half squat, and we've already determined that we've got some disassociation and some stabilization. And Tana, can I ask you to just erase that middle column so I can get going here? Thank you so much, my lovely assistant, Tana. Tana White. <laughs> Tana White. Nice. Well done. Tana White. Yeah, she's hired. Okay. So we're going to look at, first of all, um, applying the principles, our six principles, to, to these tests. So for the half squat, and, and I'm going to preface this by saying pretty much in all of these, you're going to have core control and axial elongation, some more than others. But in every single one of these, you're going to have breathing. So let's, let's make the assumption. We're just going to say, if you're doing a graph of this, you've already written in a B and a CC and AE. All right, so your core control and your axial elongation. That'll just save a little bit of extra writing. So that's sort of understood. So here, we're looking at, in the half squat, our alignment and weight bearing of the lower extremities. Okay, so that's a really important thing about your half squat. That's one of the things you're looking at, because you're looking to see if those knees collapse in, if they roll out, uh, what is that stability of the legs and keeping the spine in neutral. So the spine in neutral, we're taking care of that with our axial elongation and core control. Okay, so we're not forgetting about it. We're understanding that that's in there. So if you guys are all okay with that format, does that sound, format? Does that sound good to you guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we're going to stay with that. So full squat, again, you've got the understood core control, axial elongation, but we're going to say, well, you know, yeah, this, we're still squatting. So alignment and weight bearing of the lower extremities. Okay. Heel raise. Okay, so we've got our core control, axial elongation, our breathing. We know it's not organization of head, neck, and shoulders. We know it's not spine articulation. Right, so, we know we're not at movement integration, really. Um, it's a pretty straightforward task. So again, we are left with alignment 
and weight bearing of the lower extremities. Okay. To get you thinking about in our discussion times after we do our exercises, after we do our labs, in our discussion times is when we're kind of talking about this sort of thing or you've already got it. You guys are lucky enough to already have it in your manuals, mm -hmm. but you're going to be ready for the next weekend when you have to write all of this in yourself. So this is a good primer for you. Goal post on the wall. Okay, so we're into something else now, right? And what do you guys think? So we're really talking about upper extremities, right? It's the neck, head, and shoulder. Right, organization of head, neck, and shoulder. I should have probably done that in another color. Now, long sit, and I think I will. My lovely tone of white. Here we go. <laughs> I've got it. <laughs> so I'll do that in a different color so it's just more recognizable for you guys to just look quickly. And I would just suggest that you do it this way um, in your workbooks as well. Quick recognition. That we've gone on to something different. That here in this group, if you're seeing deficits in these three tests in a row, you're already narrowing down your group of exercises, right? And now, what do we have that addresses the upper extremity? We're starting to think about that with goalposts on the wall. We've changed, we've shifted gears a little bit. Long sit is really just your core control and axial elongation because we are not getting into organization of head, neck, and shoulders. You might be able to argue the case for alignment of the lower extremities, but it's not weight bearing. We're seated. Um, it's not movement integration. We've already got the breathing and the core control, axial elongation. Again, we're looking in general at groups of exercises that we're going to be considering, groups that we're knocking out of consideration. That's just as important as narrowing down to the groups that are in consideration. All right, so that, that takes care of us so far. So in the half squat, well, in all of these, we're going to have to come up with something for the chair, for the mat, for the reformer, for the trapeze table, and for the ladder barrel spine corrector, because that's one of the filters for creating your program, is one exercise on each piece of apparatus. Now, so far, you've got repertoire from principles, from SR1 and SR2. As you go through 3, 4, 5, and 6, you're going to be adding on exponentially. So in today's lecture, we're not going to worry if we don't have anything yet under each classification because we don't have all the repertoire yet. But by the end, you will have plenty of repertoire to fit all of those classifications. So this is the time now, while you don't have that much, to create your format to look at this, and now you can be filling in each weekend. Get yourself to sit down, think about it, process what's going on in these movements. That's where the note taking is going to be so important in the upcoming discussion times. All right, so <clears throat> we've got our half squat. And this is going to be kind of like, you know, a little pop quiz for the participants here to see what you remember, but does anything pop into your head that would address alignment and weight bearing the lower extremities that would have some disassociation of the hips and require some stabilization of the trunk that's on the chair? Double leg. Double leg pump, excellent. Okay, so we're off and running, right? Okay, so we've got double leg pump. What else have we learned so far in the chair? There's nothing in principles. Last week, so double leg pump was the first thing we started with, right? Mm -hmm. And then last time we got together, we got the lateral flexion, mm -hmm. we got the mermaid, we got the scapular work, we got the beginning of our, our prone extension into swan, right? So that's it. That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. All right, that's okay. And then we're going to move on. So, on the mat, the mat is the greatest amount of repertoire that you have at this point in time. Excuse me, I gotta get my cup of tea for that morning throat. Okay, so mat. What are we thinking about for mat? 
for disassociation of the hips, we have um, femur the dead bug and femur Dead arm. bug, femur arcs, good. I'm just going to put them here as DB slash FA. Those two typically are going to go together. Mm -hmm. You're dead bug first. Once they show enough stability and disassociation, you're moving on to femur arcs, right? So you're going to kind of understand that. Now, the, as, as we think about that, dead bug and femur arc, femur arc is a progression of dead bug. Mm -hmm. So as you're looking at your weeks, week one, week six, week 12, or beginner, intermediate, advanced, how you're looking at those programs, and your first, it could be dead bug, and then you move on to femur arc. Um, typically, you're going to move faster than that from dead bug to femur arc. Typically, it does not take that long unless somebody is very, very debilitated. Okay, so with that said, um, anything else? Anything else that you can think of? Would, would it have to do, would, I would think that uh, knee openings. That's a disassociation. That's and disassociation and stabilization. Yeah. Great. Book so open. we've got our, yeah, our, our, our uh, bent knee, right? right? So bent knee openings. So you were saying book openings. Was this what you were meaning? Yes. Okay, right. Because book openings. Oh, book work. openings are these. Okay, you're right. Okay. It's going to be addressing more mobilization of the spine. Right. Okay. Yeah. So bent knee openings, great, and we're rationalizing that that's going to help us with the disassociation of the hips. Now, we're really talking about a very sagittal plane movement, right? which bent knee openings isn't really. Mm -mm. So yes, you can rationalize it, but what would be even better that really relates to the functional movement in maybe a foreign environment that we've learned in principles S1, S2. So quadruped mm -hmm. has got that flexion oh. extension with a lot of, this is actually getting into dynamic stabilization. So for the PTs who are thinking about you know, dynamic stabilization exercises, this is sort of a quintessential one. Um, your quadruped is going to address the disassociation, the stabilization in a pretty challenging way though, but we're just listing, we're not putting it into week one week, two week, three. We kind of went over that in our little mini lecture last time, right? Mm -hmm. So you guys are good with that. But I want you to recognize as we're writing it down, we're going from very basic to very challenging. Why is this basic? You have gravity assisting you. Well, not really. Not well, with the necessarily. stabilization of the With spine. the stabilization of the trunk. But you've, you're working against gravity right. to lift that leg. So you got to be kind of careful about you know how I work that. Right. And be very specific. But what's really even more um, important about the dead bug and femur arcs is that you're on your back. You've got a ton of support. Huge mm -hmm. base of support. As in, in the picture of turning them over and putting them into quadruped, now that base of support has gone from your back on the floor to your hands and your knees. So that's that's a really huge, huge, huge difference. So just kind of thinking of it, that makes it kind of quick and easy. Okay. Is if you think of base of support and how low is that center of gravity towards the floor. So in quadruped, we're picking the center of gravity up away from the floor by the length of that person's arms and the length of their femurs. That's how far we're lifting it up. We lift it up even more when we go to a standing position. All right, so there's your incremental kind of increase in challenge. So we've got quadruped. Okay, great. Um, anything else that you can think of? So we're, we're looking at the disassociation of the hips, but also, as, as Tana pointed out, with the bent knee openings, sure, we've got that stabilization of the spine. So even something like if somebody's having a hard time learning how to disassociate their hips from their pelvis, mm -hmm. it can be very, very, very instructive to teach them pelvic clock. And why is that? Mm -hmm. Why would that be helpful to them to teach them pelvic clock? What are we doing there? Are we allowing the legs to follow the pelvis? No, mm -hmm. we're disassociating the right. right. pelvis, but we're not moving the legs, we're moving the right. pelvis. Right. So that would be a very basic place to start. Mm -hmm. Right, and so since we're coming at it from a, an entirely different place than you are looking at the movement, you've got a really good way to get in, sort of a backdoor way to get in there to do your 
re-education of their nervous system because it's something that they don't recognize. This is a whole new movement potentially mm -hmm. for them mm -hmm. to, to get that movement of the pelvis around a fixed femur. Mm -hmm. Because very often it's the pelvis that's more fixed and the femur that's doing mm -hmm. more of the movement. It's most of our, our movements are in that sort of open chain of the leg. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, great. So we've got pelvic clock now. Okay, so did that open up some new sort of vistas or possibilities for you in the way of thinking about what else might Absolutely. work? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So anything else pop into your head? So you've got the list in front of you of all the exercises you've done. You've got your manuals. Have those manuals out. Look at the page that's got the index of all the exercises that you've done. So I'm going to throw out, just for time, the um, you know, bridging. Bridging is going to require... I was wondering if, it, because you do this, mm -hmm. this as, even though it's articulation of your spine... Right. You still have that disassociation of your movement of the femur mm -hmm. from the pelvis, and you've got your trunk stability in a challenging mm -hmm. position. So we can look at bridging. We can rationalize that. Okay. Um, do you remember, and this is something that you, you know, probably were pretty well totally saturated by the time you got to this exercise in principles, and unless you've gone back and really looked at your principles manual over and over again, as I've been encouraging you to do every weekend, um, <laughs> here's my little plug, leg pull front requires a great deal of stability of the rib cage mm -hmm. as it connects to the pelvis, and it definitely requires you to be able to disassociate that like in a very, very challenging position. So here's where we can talk about against gravity mm -hmm. and we can talk about you know, gravity providing resistance for that leg lift and gravity also providing resistance just for maintaining that position. And we've got our small basis support we kind of in, in our foreign environments. We've got a lot of different things satisfied with that leg pull front. It's a great exercise. Well, there's none of them that aren't great exercises, right? Right. Right. There we go. There's my choir. Okay. So, so that's a pretty darn good start. We're, we're going to say that's a pretty darn good start. Let's move on to reformer. So, sort of our, our again, quintessential reformer exercise for disassociation at the hip, knee, and ankle. You got it, footwork. <laughs> so I'm just going to put FW. Footwork is so useful to us because it's so uh, helpful in so many different ways. It's, we've got the big base of support, so it's going to be something you're thinking about early on in the program, if they're able to do it, if they don't have any um, ankle, knee, or hip precautions that would preclude it. But as long as they're cleared for it, footwork is incredibly, incredibly helpful for the stabilization of the pelvis, and the lumbar spine while there is a disassociation of the hips. Feet and straps. I'm getting hold. Mm -hmm. Feet and straps. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. We're on a roll. What else? Um, would the what about the supine arm and ab series? Because you are in that you're you're on your your supine. Mm -hmm. and your legs are in tabletop. Right, so the legs are in tabletop. This is a really good question, uh -huh. and this is the kind of problem solving. Excellent question, thank mm -hmm. you. I couldn't have planted it better. So <laughs> the, I know you two talk about <laughs> <you. laughs> So the... I, I know you two talk <laughs> <laughs> So the act of getting the foot from the foot bar up into the tabletop position is the only time that you're disassociating, I should say, and then getting it back onto the foot bar. So it's, it's that coming to and from. It's really not a part of the exercise. Once you're there, they're stable. They're not moving. Okay. There isn't any leg. Uh, now, you could perhaps argue it in the supine abdominal series when we add coordination. Okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe the coordination. I'll, I'll, um, I'll consider that. But again, you're going to have to have a pretty good rationale for it. And if you have to really rationalize too hard, it's just kind of like life. If you've got to rationalize it too hard, it's probably not the right thing. But with that said, I would accept your rationalization on the abdominal series simply because of that coordination mm -hmm. 
variation. But I would not accept mm -hmm. the supine abdominal series. So, but that's really good for the problem solving of the why. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're thinking that it's possible, you need to know the why not mm -hmm. as much as you need to know the why. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we're going to put a little um, a little asterisk here. Supine abdominal series, and the little asterisk is just so we know amongst ourselves it's the coordination. <laughs> Okay, but we would have to, you know, in, in an exam situation, um, we'd probably want to be fairly clear about that. Okay. okay. How would they seated footwork work here? Seated footwork is excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And that's a very advanced level, I would think, possibly. Actually, you know, trouble. it's it's a very accessible exercise. Okay. Now, it's nice because it's in your familiar environment. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's actually, as long as they're placed properly on the foot bar, it's very safe and very accessible. It looks much more difficult than it truly is. And there can be that, that mental mm -hmm. piece of the fear of the round bar and being up there and having the legs on this mm -hmm. moving platform. So always being very careful about who you're choosing to do that. Are you going to choose that for, you know, your first encounter with your octogenarian? I certainly hope not. Okay. Right? So it's using your judgment, but it is actually surprisingly much more accessible. Um, because it is think. accessible like this, if you have someone, you know, is strong enough, we're not talking a, a geriatric person here, but getting them on that and having them do that because it seems like it, it is that a good way to give them a sense of self-efficacy? Absolutely. Kind of perfect that? point. Absolutely. Because so there's, the, we talk about creating that successful Success. movement experience. Mm -hmm. So you want to choose your person so that it can be the successful movement experience, but what a payoff it is for them, and for you, mm -hmm. because you're building then such a level of trust with them, but they have now taken that within themselves of, I am capable. They're going from I'm incapable to I'm capable, and there is no price for that. It is absolutely priceless, mm -hmm. yeah. Great point, great point. Okay. <clears throat> And this is great because this shows that you guys are thinking about this on a much higher level. So I'm very pleased at S2. Go team! Synergy! <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so we've got our footwork, our feet and straps, um, what seated about footwork. Scooter? Yeah, scooter. Scooter. Yeah. Right. So that's yeah. got to create the disassociation of hips from the pelvis. Mm -hmm. Great. And the standing hip stretch. And standing hip stretch. Yeah, as you take the hands away, we're, wor we're working more on balance. But, yes, we're still having to disassociate. Okay, and what else? I bet there's one more thing that you could think of on the reformer. One more thing. Because we talked about its cousin, and, and this is kind of a nice way for you to look, again, at progression. Um, to look at progression, say, for example, week one, I want to do bridging on the mat. Week six, I want to be able to do bridging on the reformer. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's just got this lovely logic to it, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. You've got their familiarity. You don't have to spend time with them on the reformer, cueing them to get that articulation so much, because you've already done that work on the, the mat. Or you may have even done it somewhere else, and we're going to get to that shortly. Okay, so I think that's pretty good on the reformer. Look at all those things that we can do for that person who's got issues with their half squat. We've got a lot of repertoire available to us, and we're only in our second unit. Okay, so trapeze table. So I kinda, I'm kind of given the farm away, right? Bridging here goes to bridging here. What could we have maybe done in between? Maybe this would be our week 12. What could we have done on the trapeze table that could be that intermediate week? The, uh, oh, let me think what it's called. It's where you have your feet on the trapeze. Seated push-through? Right. No, feet on the trapeze could only be... Oh, okay. We've only learned one thing on the trapeze. Yeah. Do you remember what the trapeze looks I like? I don't know what it's called. Uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, you can just look up on the board. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Breathing. <laughs> Breathing. <laughs> All right, good. You're welcome. Just trying to save a little time. Okay, so um, so that's the, this could be the first exercise that you put in. Let me use a different color. There we go. Eileen wants me to get more colors. One two three 
Okay, so this is our progression. We're going to do the bridging on the map first. We might even find that the bridging on the map is too difficult for them, and we might want to reverse this one and two. They might need the assistance of the trapeze. Right? So, does this sound like this is all etched in stone? Mm -mm. Not no. really. It's, it's using your judgment, and that's what Polestar wants to see, and that's what they're testing in their exam, is that you've got the critical thinking piece. The critical thinking piece is critical. <laughs> okay, how are we doing so far? Am I still keeping you guys engaged? Absolutely. Uh -huh. All right, good. That's important. So, let's think of some other things that we've done that have been very much disassociation of hips. Leg spring series through time. Mm-hmm. And going back even further. Let's dial it back. Absolutely. Dial it back. There's one that I'm waiting to hear. The Nani Nani. You got it. That's like ultra beginning level. Right. If you see that they get into that half squat, and yeah, you know, they as soon as they bend their knees, the whole spine starts to go with them. That's a lack of disassociation right there. You want to be able to see that there's a crisp delineation. Okay, so we may have to teach them that in 9090. That could be your week one. Alright, good. So anything else? We got leg spring supine breathing in 9090 so far on our track table. Footwork with the tower bar. Footwork with tower bar, thank you. Okay, footwork with tower bar. <clears throat> and anything else in our trap table disassociation of the hips from the pelvis, lumbar spine, maintain the spine in neutral. We talked about how bent knee openings had a rationale because of this disassociation of the hips. It's just in more of a rotational disassociation, mm -hmm. right? Because when we're doing the, the bent knee opening, there's some rotation and A, B, A, D, deduction okay. happening. So is there anything else just with me yeah, throwing that out? Leg spring. Side, side line. line. Okay, great. And supine so, also? Yeah, we've got supine. Oh, okay. That's the second one. Leg spring, okay, supine. Okay. Right, supine and side line. Okay. Great. Anything else that we want to put in there? I think we've pretty much we've exhausted yeah. our trapeze. Yeah, table. so there we go. Pretty good. And then ladder barrel spine corrector. What have we got in that group? So, so far in ladder barrel spine corrector, we've done bridging. supine stretch, yes. mm -hmm. we've done bridging, mm -hmm. right? We've done and we've done back forward bend. Supine stretch on both of them. And roll down and reach. Yeah, that's it. We have nothing for this. Bridging. Bridging. Oh, bridging. And then it goes all the way through. Right. So you can be looking at this bridging progression in a couple of different ways. You might want to on the week one, now that we've got an extra one in here that's really pretty darn challenging, let me change this. And you might be doing this in your week one along with the mat. Mm -hmm. Right? You mm -hmm. could be doing them both together. There's nothing that says you have to be stepwise in doing one than the other. These two are going to help each other from the very beginning and then perhaps in our, our second, which is what, week six, I'll put a six there, sorry. And then this could be our week 12. This could be where we pop the champagne, right? I feel like they've done. Could be, could be. But we're really working a lot on mobilization here. Mm -hmm. So we might want to reconsider it. You know, it really is just depending upon what you're seeing in your client, right? How are they progress progressing? What do they need? Um, okay, good. So we've kind of got a little format mm -hmm. in which we're going to be looking at this. So full squat, the difference between full squat and half squat is we're looking a little bit more at the lower extremity strength and control with the full knee flexion. Okay, so in our repertoire, let's take a look at, because half squat, full squat, and you have to go halfway in your squat to get all the way down full squat, right? Mm -hmm. So that probably means we're going to have a lot from half squat that's going to fit into full squat, right? But then we want to really fine tune it to think about in full knee flexion. 
So we might say something like, well, then we don't really want the bent knee openings as much, that rotation. We're looking more into that really full sagittal plane and strength. Um, so from that position, oh boy, bridging really takes on a whole new significance because there is a lot of the leg strengthening. You're going from a full knee flexion to a partial knee flexion. Right? So you mm -hmm. start off in full knee flexion. So we're looking at that. But let's just kind of go through this. So for your full squat, dead bugs and feet, well, let's say double leg pump, sorry. I'll back it up to the chair. I don't mean to uh, demean the chair. But the chair is, that's going to be great, right? Mm -hmm. Full knee flexion. So that's perfect. So we're going to take that one down. I'll just put a star beside it. We're going to take it down. Dead bug and femur arcs. What do you, what do you guys think about that as a group? Should that stay in there for our full squat? I think so. Absolutely. Because what, what are the knees in? They're in full flexion. Yeah. They're in flexion. Mm -hmm. They're in a night about a 90 wow. degree. It's not exactly full. And it's not weight bearing. So it's not as much strengthening. But we're still getting, we still have to have that piece of the disassociation. So I'd say, yeah, that's great there. Bent knee opening. Do we have the knee in flexion? We sure do. But we're really looking at that opening up of the hip. You could argue it either way, but I'd say it wouldn't be as much on the forefront as, say, something like Ricky. Um, the quadruped, sure, because we're working strength there of the leg moving up against gravity mm -hmm. and the torso control. So I'd say, yeah, that's a good guy to move on down. Um, pelvic clock, probably not as much of an emphasis. Bridging gets actually two stars because it is that important. And same with leg pull front for your strength. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, now is there anything else um, that is in our repertoire that I haven't considered under chair or mat at this point that would be really good for leg strengthening? We're just going to look at it from the leg strengthening perspective. Anything that is in our mat or our chair, because we're just at mat and chair right now, that we have in our repertoire that I haven't considered yet. So let's do a quick little rundown, shall we? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in our principles, we had our mat exercises were the hundred, the dead bug, femur arcs, quadruped, swan one, that sidekick, mermaid, yeah, there you go, oh. arm arcs, prone extension, assisted roll up, standing roll down, and leg pull front. So very good, sidekick. And why would sidekick, I'm just going to put it down here, sidekick, that could be a little bit more of strengthening, right? So what are we looking at in strengthening with sidekick? Well, we're definitely working on strengthening um, our core control a lot more with that exercise than the others because we have a smaller base. Right? So, what are we looking at in strengthening with sidekick? Well, we're definitely working on strengthening um, our core control a lot more with that exercise than the others because we have a smaller base of support. Good, so smaller base of support, more challenging to the core control, great. What else are we working in the leg movement itself? The hip flexors and the extensors. Well, we're really working, so in your sideline position, you're having to maintain the weight of your leg up against gravity, right? So the muscles that are on the outside of the hip, your tensor fascia lata, your gluteus medius, all of these hip abductors mm -hmm. are going to be working harder. Bits of your gluteus is going to be working as well. So think about a squat. So a lot of you wrote mm -hmm. about sit to stand mm -hmm. and squat in your written assignment. Were those muscles important at all in mm -hmm. your sit to stand and your squat? Absolutely. Absolutely. And what do they do in the squat? They're not flexing you at the hip or extending you at the hip, but they're doing what? Stabilizing. Stabilizing. Great. Good job, Suzanne. So could that not be important for the half squat as well? Absolutely. There we go. Good, 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 good. Okay, so we got that rationale. So you know what that means? 
That means you write down your list of exercises and you keep going back and taking a look. <coughs> because there's going to be more and more, right, as we go on. Yeah, great. Good job. Good job. Okay, this is the problem solving that I want to see. Excellent. All right, so now we're going to move on to, um, to our reformer. We haven't gone through that yet. And we'd say, okay, so we're looking at our lower extremity strength and control. And Suzanne did a beautiful job of focusing in on this control piece with sidekick. So she gets extra gold stars right on her forehead. Okay. So our footwork, what do we think about that? In light of how we're, we just talked about um, strengthening the lower extremity strength and control. Strength and control. What are some of the things that we really look for in footwork on the reformer? Or what is some of the really great information that it can give you as an instructor? As you're looking at somebody's feet and you're looking at how that second toe orients to that kneecap and how that kneecap orients you to the hip. You can see weakness in their abduction or adduction because their feet will turn in or out because mm -hmm. of that. So we're going back to that control issue, right? Mm -hmm. Strength and control. Having the strength to control, but also having the proprioceptive awareness mm -hmm. to control, knowing what it feels like. Okay, great. So I think we're going to keep footwork, yes? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, what about feet and straps? I think that definitely, especially if you do things like frog. Frog. Really frog, really right. So, so Tana brings up a really good point about frog, that that's going to be that full knee flexion can you maintain that pelvis in neutral in the full knee flexion? And what will, you, what will you see really commonly? Or what have you felt in your bodies when you've practiced it about keeping that pelvis in place when those knees are all the way in? I've seen, observing that people tuck under a lot, it makes them tuck under. They right. In. So that is a lack of ability to... Stabilize that neutral spine. And to... Control your pelvis. Uh, control. And associate your hips. You got it. There we go. So, so it's satisfying then our need to disassociate at the hips and also to strengthen and create that control around the hips. Now, with a lot less feedback or stability that's provided by the foot bar. So the foot bar is creating that closed chain environment that is going to be more akin to the actual movement that was being tested in the fitness screen. So always going back to that. So your, your footwork is going to be more towards a familiar, more towards it, but not all the way there because you still have, you're, you're looking at the ceiling. You're not in a familiar orientation to gravity. So from the orientation to the task itself, it's foreign, but it's a closed chain action. So we're getting there. It's a great place, again, to re-educate because you're taking away the reference points that tend to keep those faulty movement patterns. That's proprioception, going. too. And your proprioception, right. It gives you a lot more okay. feedback. So there's a lot, of thing that can, a lot of things that can happen with feet and straps. You can see people's legs going all wonky. Mm -hmm. You can see a lot of asymmetry in the placement of their legs, and this helps them to learn then that, that alignment and create the strength that we need. All right, supine abdominal series. Are we going to take the argument on that? Are we going to take that rationale? I would say that you're really stretching it with this one because the only thing it would really work with the other one was with um, the when we were doing the the half uh, squat. The well, when we were doing the coordination. It's right, the we coordination. Really so we said, and we did the coordination right, for the, the disassociation. Legs. Right. And, and what's key about this, about it not strengthening the legs? What's going what's gonna to help you make your decision? So I talked about the foot bar being closed chain. There's no... It Bending. Well, it, there's, right. there, it, there's no chain. It's an open chain. It's, it's an open chain. Very good. Mm -hmm. It's an open chain. And that's the way I want you guys to be thinking mm -hmm. about this. You guys are going to have to know closed chain, open chain, pseudo-closed chain. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Just make sure we keep going back to these things. It's going to help you. You guys are already studying for your exam now. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we're not going to take that one. It doesn't get a star to move down to our full squat doesn't get a left-sided star. Okay, seated foot, which just makes me think of Dr. Seuss and the speeches on the beaches, you know, there's lots of stars on their bellies. Okay, seated footwork, sorry, I digress. Seated footwork, 
What are we thinking about that guy? Oh, I think that's a great one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good one. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the benefits of that? Just for choosing it, just for, for even to help you as you're working with a client. What's the benefit of that? You're getting closer to the actual movement itself because you're bringing them upright with mm -hmm. their spine mm -hmm. and the stability there. So they're... <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome to put any of these pictures on Facebook, I guess I'm doing. Mm -hmm. That'd be good. Okay, so we were talking about the benefits of the seated footwork as it relates to the full squat. And uh, in that discussion, we brought up that uh, the one of the big advantages of that is that the client can now see the alignment of their legs. So they can make those corrections. That's going to hold true for your footwork with the tower bar. But these are just important considerations. So we're going to say seated footwork stays. Um, scooter is definitely a strengthener, mm -hmm. so it can stay. Standing hip stretch, again, not as much, because it's more into stretching. It can create a little bit of strength. So you know you just have to really rationalize that. But again, that bridging is our favorite. For this we love it and uh, because it's going to build that really good strength and they're coming from that full knee flexion now do we love the breathing as much now I would say that it would be a very intro level so it would depend right. on what problems they so had. if right so if there was a need to take put breathing in there to teach them bridging yeah but for this not really because the knees are in extension the whole time you are going to get some hamstring strengthening but it's got a weaker argument. Leg springs, serious supine, great. We're working on strength. We can get them into variations with the knee flexion. 90-90, again, is going to be your more remedial. You may need to do that. It may be very important for you. Footwork with the tower bar, for the same reason that footwork seated worked on the reformer. And again, leg springs, serious sideline, to bring that balance. And also doing the side kick with that series, yes. Right. Great. Exactly. So your side kick when you're doing leg spring series sideline, where does the emphasis shift from doing it on the mat? We talked about the muscles that are working on the mat, right? What muscles were those? The adductors. Right, the hip abductors. So what's going to be working with your leg springs sideline? The adductors. The adductors. So now you're getting balance around the joint. So we're always kind of going for balance, strength, and flexibility around the joints, right? Yeah. Okay, great. And then our bridging on the ladder barrel takes a lot of articulation of the spine, but it is going to take leg strength. Um, again, that one can kind of be sitting on the fence a little bit, but we just don't really have much from ladder barrel, so if you need to throw something <laughs> in the ladder barrel, that's all we've got right now, so there we go. All right, so we're going to work now down to heel raise. And I'm going to go through this a little more quickly because now you've got the format, right? So I'm not here to just give you all everything that fills in the blanks. That's not the point of this lecture. The point of this lecture is to give you the framework within which to do the problem solving for you to fill, fill out the sort of scaffolding that I've provided for you. Okay, so now do you feel like we're on a roll a little bit? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to move a little faster clip. Otherwise, we're going to be here all day. <clears throat> So for heel raise, it you know what we were looking at was strength and balance, and so that balance we said was going to require some stabilization of the trunk. So you can put in really anything that teaches <clears throat> that trunk stability with disassociation. You could rationalize that out, but we're really looking now. We're down to the ankles. And, and what have we had so far that's going to focus on the ankles? We've got variations in our double leg pump, mm -hmm. right? And that's pretty much it for the chair. On the mat, we have very, very little that we could really look at. I would venture to say nothing much other than leg pull front variation with having the ankle flex and point. Mm -hmm. okay. So the flexing and pointing because on that foot that's weight bearing is going to increase some calf strength. What about, and this rationality may be reaching, but side kick because you flex and point. Are you weight bearing? No. 
open. So are you going to strengthen? No. Well, you might a little bit. You might strengthen a little bit. But is it going to be enough? Is it going to be our most effective thing to choose for heel raise? Right? So it's really, really reaching. But like pull front, we can see how that individual is going to increase their calf strength in that way. You could have them stay in that leg pull front position and just work the, the uh, ankle dorsiflexion plantar flexion piece with them in a plank position. Um, <clears throat> so now as we go to reformer, we're looking, oh great, we've got footwork where we do the, uh, the heels dropping under the bar and raising in a lot of different ways. We've got our sort of bird on the wire. Right, where we're getting that heel to drop down. It's, it's staying more statically down. It's more mm -hmm. of a stretch, but it's still going to help them to gain that range of motion. We've got in you know external rotation, parallel internal rotation, that ability to lower and lift. Wow. And that's going to bias, right, and walking in place. So the internal external rotation are going to bias different heads of the gastrocnemius. So that's where the specificity is nice. And then the parallel is going to work the whole thing. And the walking in place is really more for the ability to stabilize the pelvis while you're creating a more complicated motion throughout the kinetic chain. It's really kind of, that's, okay. that's working more okay. coordination. So for full on strengthening, it's going to be those two feet or a single foot. If you see there's a disparity. There can sometimes be in this test a huge difference between right and left. You can do unilateral. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do bilateral. Right? Okay. Um, so are feet and straps going to accomplish too much for us? Not unless we're, we're doing, again, that frog variation where we go into dorsiflexion as the knees flex and the hips flex, and the plantar flexion as the knees extend and the hips extend. You could perhaps rationalize that. So we'll just say, well, we don't have too much, so we'll say feet and straps. And again, that seated footwork, in that seated footwork, you can also incorporate the dorsi and the plantar flexion. Mm -hmm. And they've got their eyes on their ankles so they can see their alignment. <clears throat> so you can build a little bit of strength there. Um, really, the, the rest of the, um, of the reformer work, mm -hmm. you know, there's really not a whole lot there except for maybe scooter. Um, Again, for that calf muscle strength in that standing leg, there's a lot of stabilization around the ankle to create the dynamic movement of the leg on the carriage. So the leg that you're strengthening is your standing leg. So I'm going to put scooter there for that reason. You're not getting into a heel raise and lower, but you're having to work ankle stability there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. As you take the hands away, you've got to be working more and more ankle stability. <clears throat> and then you could even take that into the standing hip stretch with no hands, potentially. Um, but I'm going to leave it there with scooter. And then uh, for the trap table, uh, anything that comes to mind right off? Let's say foot, footwork with tower footwork bar. Footwork with tower mm -hmm. bar, because that's so similar mm -hmm. to our footwork here. Mm -hmm. We can vary the springs. Okay, great. And... Uh, what about leg spring series? I would say that it, that would be more like feet and straps. So the only thing you would have is if you did like a frog with it. Right. You'd have to you'd have to put in some kind of a variation. This is going to be much more logical and productive for you. You're not going to get as much productivity about the leg spring series supine. But if you had a way or a reason to rationale, have a rationale, pardon me for it. Um, potentially. And then ladder barrel spine corrector, um, we're probably really pushing it with bridging at this point, so I'm, I'm just going to leave that and say, you know, we just don't have that much repertoire at this point in time. We're going to be filling in more repertoire as we go that's going to get to this, right? But for now, at this point in time, not a whole lot. Okay, goalpost on the wall, we're shifting gears. We've changed colors from the red, alignment, weight bearing of the lower extremity. Now we're having to shift our focus, our mental focus, into a, a little different area of our repertoire. So we're going to be seeing some different exercises here. So for a goal post on the wall, organization of head, neck, and shoulders. On the chair, we just got a nice bit of repertoire 
the past weekend that we were together, S and R2, um, that addressed a lot of the scapular alignment. Um, not everything addressed the shoulder abduction, external rotation, um, but we were looking at how the shoulder girdle organizes in relationship to the thoracic spine to the rib cage. So we have we do have some work there. So anything that you can think of off the top of your head from um, for the chair. Prone scapular series. Okay, so you know we can definitely say that we we need to be able to to look at at that organizational piece. And what other positions did we get into on the chair that challenged that one of the very first things we needed to do was establish that scapular alignment that we maybe learned in our prone the scapular swan. series? The swan. The swan. No. Swan to okay. get into extension. Now here, I'm going to give you something to think about though. If we're looking at goalposts on the wall, and as I prefaced it at the beginning, part of the lecture, um, that what you're going to see is, is that tendency to extend. So if somebody has more of a tendency to extend, mm -hmm. then perhaps we want to think about SWAN at a later point in time to see if they can integrate it. So I'm going to put it on there, but with the caveat mm -hmm. that extension could be the problem. Lateral flexion. Mm. Lateral flexion yeah. and mermaid, both. Okay. Lateral flexion and mermaid both required that we have an integration of the scapula uh -huh. in, again, here's a, a foreign environment, right? So this is your optimal opportunity to really get in there and change the movement patterns. So I'm going to prioritize lateral flexion and mermaid. And later on, they can show you that they can limit, control their extension in swan. But we're not really swan. So that would be more is progression. more mobilization of the uh -huh. spine, right? We're looking at more stabilization. So control, disassociation, stabilization. The control of the spine is going to be more stability. This is more mobility. Even though these are both mobility, they have a benefit of being able to relate the scapula to the spine, again, in that foreign environment. And with the arm, and it satisfies our shoulder abduction, right? So that's, that's sort of your double benefit. You've got the shoulder abduction as you go over into your mermaid and also in your lateral flexion. Think about um, even the, the variations of that lateral flexion, where we've got the arm and leg movement, right? All that challenging. That's a ton of this spine control. Now with the shoulder held in abduction, and you could actually externally rotate that hand placement on the pedal if that's needed. It's going to be just a little bit, and it's going to help to seat that shoulder blade in anyway. As we, we've talked about, right, that the, the retraction of the scapula goes hand in hand with external rotation of the humerus. Okay, okay so <clears throat> great, some more great problem solving. So, uh, anything else that we've missed? A goal post on the wall? With chair? With chair. Anything that you think is going to make it? Going to make the cut? Think Stay on it. the island. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're what we got at this point. Mm -hmm. Alright, so let's move on to Matt, shall we? Our works, definitely. Great, and why? Uh, because it's disassociation of the shoulders at its purest. Mm -hmm. yeah, I love it. Mm -hmm. Disassociation of the shoulders at its purest, at its finest. Lovely. Okay, so we've got arm arcs, and that's a good place to start. Um, anything else that pops into your head? Scarecrow. Hmm? Scarecrow. Oh, yeah. That's very good. Yeah. Scarecrow is excellent. And what is so excellent about Scarecrow? It's got that beautiful mm -hmm. piece of external rotation, mm -hmm. right? It's the, you're actually so in the that, position. That's it. That's your first thing. You're in the position, and you've got your external rotation, so you've got to be able to get that goalpost. Now, is that going to be the first thing that you're going to put this person in if they're restricted? Mm -hmm. No, it's going to be your final, your goal, but yes. Again, that's where we pop the champagne. Okay, good. So, what else? That was excellent, Karen. 
So we've got scarecrow, anything else? Compressor. Compressor. Mm -hmm. Dart. Yeah. Now, what about dart is not as good as scarecrow and prone press -up? The extension, this mm -hmm. person may have problems with extension. And right, and, and what else does it not satisfy for us? The spine? Or no. Balance. What position are your arms in? Behind oh, you. Yeah. Dart. Dart. Behind. Or next to you. Right. So we don't have our abduction and external rotation satisfied. Okay. You could argue that palms up is external rotation. You'd be absolutely right. However, we're looking at an external rotation with the arm in elevation. So it's not, not exactly analogous. Um, but, you know, if you, you, again, you'd have to really rationalize that. <laughs> okay, so good, good, we're thinking. But then why am I saying okay with prone press up? If I'm saying dart, I'm not so sure. Why am I saying okay with prone press up? Stability plus it's weight bearing. Yeah, it's the weight bearing mm -hmm. piece, and that can provide so much proprioceptive input. And that touch. Right, that's, yeah, it's the weight bearing mm -hmm. all the way through mm -hmm. the extremities. Mm -hmm. So, and then we talked about, and I'm going to go back to principles again. I'm going to keep doing this to you guys. Do you remember feed back and feed forward? Mm -hmm. Right, so. What about the weight bearing then is going to help them with utilizing that feedback feed forward mechanism? They're going to have some, it's that um, proprioception again. Like there you are, good. It's the proprioception are piece. That's it, it's proprioception, period. Mm -hmm. You get much less proprioception from an open chain. That's one of the benefits of closed chain exercise. Increased proprioceptive input into the joint. Right. So, there you go. Make sense? Because mm -hmm. they, they may not be aware of where the scapula is mm -hmm. right, as they're going into this goalpost. And that might be why they cannot access their external rotation. Could you argue right. quadruped would be good for this? You could argue quadruped just because of that input. And you are going, you can take your arm. In quadruped, we teach you the mm -hmm. flexion movement. Right. right? But there is really no reason why you couldn't make it much more challenging with some abduction. Okay. Because as you go away from center, you're having to create a whole lot more control in your, in your um, relationship of your rib cage to your pelvis. So your obliques are working a lot harder. So you, then you're satisfying the spine control, but you're also getting the proprioceptive input. So we're going to say quadruped, but you're going to have to come up with a quadruped variation. Right, to really make it align beautifully. But it's not a bad place to start. It's not a bad place to start to make them aware of the scapula. All right, so anything else that you want to throw in there for Matt that you don't have to rationalize too hard? I think that's it. Do you think that this person would benefit at all from book openings? Keeping those short. Okay, wait a second. What position is the arm in? Externally mm -hmm. rotated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, am I externally rotated or am I in neutral? I'm in neutral. neutral. My thumb up, I'm in neutral. Okay. Well, you don't move from neutral. Right. If you're I could be externally right. rotated palm up to the ceiling or internally rotated palm down. Okay. So, where, but where is my arm? It's come from here mm -hmm. to here. So where does it come? Neutral. To? Neutral. Abducted. To abducted. Oh. This is abduction away from the body. It is an and we're looking at shoulder abduction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? And some organization of the scapula on the trunk as we're moving the trunk. It's mobilization, but we've still got that scapular positioning on the trunk. We've got the arm in abduction. And now we've got that arm in abduction as it starts to encounter gravity more and more and more through the rotation of the ribcage. Right, so I'm going to say book openings. All right. It's a lovely way to stretch the anterior chest. And the anterior chest wall can be a big restriction. The tightness in the anterior chest wall can be a big restriction of the goalpost. So what did we talk about last time we were together? And we, we got to goalpost. Everybody said, tight packs, tight packs. What could this do? 
Open up those tags. There you go. Okay. I think that made it clear to you. Yes? Yes, okay. absolutely. Very good. So let's move along now to our reformer, shall we? And what have we encountered in our reformer repertoire to this point? Our arm series. Our arm series. Right. You can walk through Tahira. No worries. <laughs> okay, so supine arm series, great. Anything else? It wasn't very well written, was that? My, my writing's getting worse and worse. <laughs> supine arm series. Okay, so anything else you could think of? Maybe it's um, you might a bit of a variation. Say the supine abdominal series. But it's just, well, no, because I think I retract. She <laughs> retracts. Okay, she retracts her suggestion. That's, that's fine. You can After I actually did the movement, I retract. Yeah. All right, so. Anything else? But, Nothing else? We what about kind of abdominal surge? If degrees. we're saying mermaid for yeah. the, would mermaid on the reformer work here as well? Absolutely. Yeah. And what's great about the mermaid on the reformer? Yes, it's closed chain, and you get that proprioceptive input into the joint. Everybody was right on that one. <laughs> so we got our feet forward, feet back. We're on a roll, aren't we? We're going to just roll right through this. And Cleopatra. Right. <laughs> Cleopatra. So Cleopatra kind of falls into that, too. Mm -hmm. And what, what else is Cleo going to do? Gonna Open up that chest as well. Yeah. Do we get into abduction in Cleo? Yes. You better believe yes. it. Oh my gosh, we get into it beautifully. Yeah, great, great catch there, Suzanne. Love it. Okay, and then um, anything else? Anything else? I think that's pretty good on Reformer. Okay, so let's move along to TT, trap table, not the Audi TT. Mm -hmm. And uh, what could we have... In there, we've got some nice things there. Supine scapular series. Supine scap mm -hmm. series. Okay. And um, a nice one into shoulder abduction to talk about your scapular orientation. Does this ring a bell to anybody? Oh, uh, yes. And that is? So you did pull down. So you did pull down. down. Good. Okay. Have we exhausted our TT? I bet push. there's something else. Mm -hmm. What about seated push through? I front? love it. Yeah. Seated push through. And why do I love it? Because that has that uh, postural alignment and spine control. With it? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's right. Start conduction. Uh -huh. And where is my arm going? Into uh, external rotation and abduction. Okay, it's going all the way around. Mm -hmm. So circumduction grabs all the planes of motion. Okay. Great. Now, onto ladder barrel spine corrector. Ladder barrel spine corrector. Ladder barrel spine corrector. So we talked about a lot of the, what our repertoire so far was mobilization of the spine, but there's some, there's a couple things in there that but could help you. Could we say that the... Go ahead, Karen. Uh, I'm sorry. Karen had one. Back to forward bend. Yes, then. back to forward bend, and why? Because you're opening up the arms into extension. Right. So again, think about that chest wall tightness. Right? So we're, is that, that's a beautiful stretch for everything in the anterior aspect of the body and the posterior aspect of the body. Right? So great. Mm -hmm. All right. So anything else that might fit that? Maybe in the spine corrector? A supine stretch. Um, where, what are your arms doing with supine stretch? Are we looking at arms? Are we looking at spine? Are we looking at okay. spine mobility? Supine stretch? No. Which one are we thinking of? The roll down and reach. Roll down and reach. Roll down and reach, okay. Yeah. 
supine stretch was pretty much hands behind the head, protecting yeah, the okay. head, and just into thoracic extension flexion. But this is this is where you want to be doing these things. This is where you want to blurt it out and then get that rationale, and then go okay. Mm. And we're in a den. And you guys are still wrapping your heads around the names of these exercises, too. So you're doing very, very well with the names. Okay. Um, anything else there for ladder barrel spine corrector? I think that's it. I think we're reaching with anything else. I would agree. Okay, so we're down to long sit. I'm going to have to kneel to write on this one. So for long sit, which is a lot for me to say I have to kneel to get to anything. We're looking at hamstring flexibility and spine stability. We're looking at core control axial elongation. Right? So we're going to look at that. We're looking at some disassociation, stabilization. We're really looking at pure on hamstring flexibility and spine stability. So far, we haven't hit a whole ton of things, but we do have some things that will still satisfy. So let's start with the chair. Anything from the chair repertoire that we're thinking of? You know, probably nothing much. I would think the double leg pump would be Double leg pump is really the only thing that we've got that even comes close. It's hip and knee flexion and extension. Some external rotation, abduction, internal rotation, depending upon your variations. Do any of those things add to hamstring flexibility? Not really. Not really. So, um, I'm, I'm just going to say no. Okay. We don't really have anything. <laughs> we really don't have anything on the chair that I'm recalling to this point. Okay, so now let's go down to, get all of these out of the way. Let's go down to our um, mat. Our mat is next. So, double leg pump. We said no on the chair, we're on long sit, mat. We got a really nice one last weekend. So if you look at your SR2 list under mat, think of one that you, you're going to see it. As soon as you read it, you're going to go, oh, spine, 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 stretch. spine stretch. Excellent. I knew you'd recognize that right away. Okay, so we've got spine stretch. We've got a place to start here. Anything else? It's going to challenge that hamstring flexibility. You might have to go back to your principles. You might have to look at that principles list. And, and I'm asking, I don't feel confident in this. That's okay. Um, but would doing supine arm series and uh, prone press up help with lengthening those hamstrings because you're in that, that prone position? That would help to lengthen your hip. Flexors. Hip flexors and your hamstrings are hip strength. extensors. Okay. So we're really not looking there at bridging. all. Okay. So is bridging going to help to lengthen the hamstring? No. Roll up, will. Roll, Roll up. up. Okay. Great. And then going back to your principles, what did we have that's a cousin of the roll up? This is assisted roll up. Okay. What about another cousin that would do something for your hamstrings? Another cousin. It's got a big family. It's got lots of relatives. <laughs> the, well, uh, Do you remember, and, and again, going back to principles is always tough because you get so much information in there, but there was a standing version of the roll down there. Oh, standing roll so down. Standing roll down. In standing, <laughs> right. So in standing, can you see how that's going to help mm -hmm. to build the hamstring length? So that's pretty good. I think that's about all of the repertoire that we have that's going to fit Bill here. So standing roll down is going to come before roll up because we've got to build that hamstring length. Right? Okay. And then we go into reformer. What have we got under reformer? Thinking along the same lines. I hamstring length. say foot and straps would help with that considerably. Okay. And I would agree. Feet and straps. And what else? Um, footwork with uh, heels under the bar. Footwork. You got it. Excellent. 
So that's already got you thinking ahead to trapeze table, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. See how this stuff goes? Mm -hmm. You start to think that way. And as you're creating this yourself, you don't have to stop and do all of your reformer. You could say, oh, footwork, okay, footwork with the tower bar, great. Okay, so you can do this however you want to do this. I'm just trying to give you a framework. You're going to make this your own. All right, so we've got our, our feet and straps and our footwork. Seated footwork. I think seated footwork. Oh, boy. Seated footwork. <laughs> it didn't come out too well. It just looks like a scribble. Okay, and um, anything else that anybody wants to suggest? Long sit. We're lengthening out those hamstrings. So we're stretching. We're stretching. Scootering. We're stretching. No. Keep going. Standing hip stretch. Standing hip stretch. Excellent. Okay. I think that's pretty good. How about trapeze table? See the push the yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Seated push through. You've got to get that length to be able to push that through. All right. Um, as we go back and look at the mat, is there anything else that you might be thinking of? What about would the roll the roll down series? Right, roll down series. And that would so be on go the roll reformer up. as well. We have the roll down series. On the reformer as well, absolutely. So that's where it's kind of nice to go, uh, to not just be thinking in just these little cells of mat reformer trap table and know that you can go back and go, oh yeah, roll up series or roll down. Pardon me, that's roll down series. And that series. goes on the ladder barrel to roll down and reach. Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay, so we've got roll down series here on trap table, roll down series here on reformer, and roll down and reach is what Suzanne said. Yes. Uh -huh. If she's right, Suzanne said it. Yeah. <laughs> she's wrong, Suzanne's <laughs> not saying it. If it's the right answer, that was Suzanne's answer. Okay, got it. Got it. She told me that at the beginning. Okay. Anything else? What about on the trapeze table breathing? So for lengthening the hamstrings, right. So what about it? Now I, I see some quizzical looks, and this is good. This is the problem solving. Yes, Tana got the whole nonverbal of what? <laughs> <laughs> that whole deflated posture. So, but Karen's got a very good point. On the descent, mm -hmm. when there is the control, yeah. right? You're getting into that elongation of the hamstrings. And you're adding weight bearing to it also, so that weight bearing is through the, the scapula for breathing. Right, but like in the legs for that control for stability to keep it stable. Right, that's good for the um, the spine stability. Right, right, because you're you are and, and what what in our um, in our pole star speak, what are we doing to create that through the breathing exercise? How are we creating that spine stability? In pole star speak. In exam speak. Um, and it's really, truly what's happening. Not just an indoctrination. It's really, truly what's happening. So we talk about one of the most important things, going back to, again, principles, is this, the mobility, that piece of segmental articulation Something has to turn off and something has to turn on. Your, you're talking about your spine extensors. Okay. All right, so what? Feedback. Feed forward feedback. Not quite feed forward feedback. We're getting into something else now. We're talking about what spinal articulation might have to release. One thing that's in common about all of the spinal articulation mm -hmm. repertoire that under the spinal articulation principle we talked about at length. Elongation? That would be under the axial elongation core control principle. But that is a big part of this. You do have to have the elongation to get the articulation. You're absolutely right. They're related. But we talked about global 
and so low stabilizers. stabilizers. So Karen's rationale is absolutely right on for breathing mm -hmm. being a movement that is going to improve the spine stability through the mechanism of turning on the local stabilizers and turning off the global stabilizers. Because so if you're trying to make excellent. those individual spinal extensors, you don't want those large mus muscles controlling the movement as you Right, so down. the smaller locals okay. only go a couple of segments, maybe one segment. Most of them go two to three segments. Mm -hmm. That's considered local. The globals cover big areas of the spine. So in order to articulate one bone at a time, which one's going to be most effective? One that goes a long way or one that goes a short distance, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The short one's going to actually move the bone by bone. Okay, good. So that was, I'm going to want to hear you in a chorus of Polestar speak. So the benefit of segmental articulation as we look at the long sit exercise in uh, gaining more spinal stability is it activates the local stabilizers, the, the, the global, global stabilizers. stabilizers. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself, ladies. Thank you. All right. You can pause.